today we are looking at a case from the very start of the 20th century. So sit back as we go to England. Emily Hinchcliffe was born in 1861 in the small Yorkshire village of Cowthorne, which is near Barnsley. She was the eighth of ten children born to John and Hannah Hinchcliffe. Like many men in the second part of the 19th century, her father worked as a coal miner. At the time, coal was in high demand, especially in the steel, iron and textile industries. Between 1830 and 1870, the output of British coal mines surged from 17 million tonnes to over 120 million tonnes annually, much of which fuelled the factories that produced iron. During Emily's childhood, it was not mandatory for children to attend school. In fact, compulsory school attendance in England and Wales wasn't enforced until 1880, when children aged between 5 and 10 were required to attend. Although there were free schools available, parents often had to supply materials such as ink and paper, making education difficult for many families. As a result, some children stayed at home or were sent to work instead of attending school. Despite these challenges, literacy rates were improving. By the time Emily was 16 years old, it was estimated that less than 20% of the adult population in England was illiterate. This marked a significant shift in society, as more children were learning to read and write, opening up new opportunities for future generations. Emily married Mr William Swan, a man who earned his living as a glassblower. He was well regarded in the community, for both his craft and his character. People saw him as a respectable and hard-working individual, known for his dedication and his steady, reliable nature. Over the following years, Emily gave birth to 11 children. This was not uncommon in the Victorian era, as many families relied on the children to help with household chores or contribute to the family's income. Children as young as eight were often sent to work in factories, mines, or in large houses to work as domestic servants. On the 22nd of January 1901, Queen Victoria died, ending the Victorian era. Emily, now 39, had aged with the years of hard work. Her face showed lines from the long days of managing her household, and her hands were worn from constant labour. Though often tired, she remained strong and steady, pushing through her daily tasks. Life had been demanding, but she had built a sense of quiet pride in how she cared for her large family. Following the death of the Queen, she realised that the world around her was changing, but her focus stayed on the simple, familiar routine of her home. Emily was quite small, just 4 foot 11 inches, but she was not an unattractive woman and always tried to look her best. However, the demands of living and working in the late 19th and early 20th centuries had changed William Swan. The pressure of providing for a large family, combined with the physical strain of his work as a glassblower, had taken a toll on his character. Once known as a respectable and hard-working man, William's reputation had darkened over the years. The stress and exhaustion had fueled a quick temper, and he had developed a tendency to become aggressive. Unfortunately, this violence was often directed towards his wife, tarnishing his former image in the community, and leaving her to endure the brunt of his outbursts behind closed doors. Neighbours would often hear the sounds of their disputes, and it became clear to those around them that Emily lived in constant fear of her husband's temper. By 1903, William and Emily had taken a lodger into their house, a 30-year-old man named John Gallagher. John worked as a colliery labourer. He was strong and hard-working, and had started to show particular attention towards Emily. In her turbulent marriage to William, she had lacked emotional support and affection, so this newfound attention made her feel valued and appreciated. John's caring nature offered a welcome change from her difficult home life, allowing her to feel a sense of comfort and reassurance that had been absent for so long. It was a simple kindness that helped her cope with her challenging circumstances. However, as rumours began to circulate about an inappropriate relationship between Emily and John, the situation at her home quickly deteriorated. The whispers grew louder, and with them, William's treatment of his wife became even more cruel and abusive. With all the tension, the atmosphere inside the small house became unbearable. Eventually, sensing the growing hostility, John decided that it would be best if he found somewhere else to live. Although he moved out, for some reason he kept returning to the house, and this only stirred up more suspicion. Each visit reignited local gossip, 
leaving the neighbours to speculate about the nature of his involvement in Emily's life. Some believed they were involved in an improper relationship, while others thought that John had different motives for being there. Regardless of the truth, his frequent appearances ensured that the whispers about their troubled connection continued, which made it difficult for Emily to maintain her reputation. By June 1903, John had made the decision to leave Wanwell altogether and relocate to Bradford. However, on the 6th of June, just a few days before he planned to leave, he went to visit a lady named Mrs Ward, who was a neighbour of the Swans, and started drinking. Later, Mrs Emily Swan knocked on Mrs Ward's door. She was visibly upset, with a shawl draped over her head. When she removed it, she revealed two black eyes and bruises on her face. She told the neighbour that she had been beaten by her husband. The physical signs of abuse were stark, and her distress was evident. John Gallagher saw the state of Emily's face and became enraged. The extent of the poor woman's injuries were severe, and he was not a man who was known for controlling his temper. In fact, he had a reputation for being quick to anger and impulsive in his reactions. His emotions often got the better of him, and once provoked, it was difficult for him to hold back or think rationally. He stormed out, heading directly towards the Swan's house, with Emily desperately following him, trying to keep up. John's rage was clear as he shouted, I'll coffin him before morning, signalling his intent to seriously harm William. Inside the house, the sounds of a fierce struggle echoed through the walls, alarming the neighbours, some of who went inside to see what was going on. The confrontation between John and William escalated quickly, with the noise of their fighting lasting for about ten minutes. John eventually emerged from the house, and appearing somewhat agitated, he went back to Mrs Ward's home, leaving onlookers in disbelief. He boasted that he had broken four of Mrs Swan's ribs, and indicated that he would break some more. It was apparent that his anger hadn't subsided, and moments later, he announced that he would finish him off before he went to Bradford. He then returned to the Swan's house, yelling in a loud voice, I'll murder the pig before morning. If he can't kick a man, he shan't kick a woman. As neighbours followed him inside, another fight erupted, and sounds again emanated from the property. A few minutes later, the tension outside seemed to dissolve into an eerie calm. Emily and John emerged hand in hand, their behaviour completely at odds with the brutality that had just unfolded. Neighbours were shocked by the sudden shift and described the couple as displaying every sign of affection, as though nothing horrific had just occurred. However, behind them, inside the house, William Swan lay dead. Unfazed, John and Emily calmly walked towards Mrs Ward and confessed what had happened. Meanwhile, word of Mr William Swan's death soon spread and police arrived at the scene. After seeing the dead man laying on the floor, they arrested Mrs Swan. But when they looked for John Gallagher, they were unable to find him. He had disappeared. He was missing for two months before he was arrested in the town of Middlesbrough and brought back to Barnsley, where along with Emily, he was charged with the deliberate murder of Mr William Swan. Police Superintendent Guest claimed that he could show that Emily had urged Mr Gallagher to kill her husband by beating him to death. They were both taken to Barnsley Police Courts, where a gentleman named Mr Riddle led the case for the prosecution. However, Mrs Swan and Mr Gallagher were unrepresented. Mr Riddle asked them several questions about the death of Mr Swan, and witnesses testified that Mr Gallagher hadn't left the Swan's house voluntarily. He had in fact been expelled by Mr Swan, due to Mr Gallagher paying too much attention to Mr Swan's wife. The witnesses said that despite this, Mr Gallagher continued to go to the house and visit Mrs Swan. Some witnesses testified to have seen Mr Gallagher hitting the deceased man and also testified to have seen Mrs Swan strike him down with a poker and shout, give it to him Johnny. It was noted that the deceased had 20 bruises on his body and police officers told the courts that when they apprehended Mr Gallagher in Middlesbrough, he said, I might as well speak the truth. I never used the poker, but the woman did. It was concluded that both defendants should stand trial for the charge of willful murder. The trial commenced in December 1903 at the West Riding Assizes in Leeds and was presided over by Justice Darling. Many witnesses who had given testimony at the police courts the previous August returned to testify. However, this time, 
both Mr Gallagher and Mrs Swan had legal representation, which allowed for a more structured and formal presentation of their case. Mr Mitchell, the counsel for Mr Gallagher, contended that on the day of the attack, his client had been under the influence of alcohol. Mr Mitchell said that Mr Gallagher's judgment and actions had been significantly impaired following an afternoon of drinking in the house of a neighbour of the Swans named Mrs Ward. He added that it was only when Mrs Swan came to Mrs Ward's house and revealed her bruises that Mr Gallagher became angry. Mr Mitchell went on to tell the court that John Gallagher had acted under the combined influence of intoxication and provocation and urged that due to this, his actions warranted a verdict of manslaughter rather than murder. Mrs Swan was represented by Mr Harold Newell. He argued that she had not encouraged Mr Gallagher to murder her husband and emphasised that her actions did not constitute incitement and that she should not be held accountable for Mr Gallagher's behaviour. The judge carefully considered the defence's arguments and when addressing the jury, highlighted the principle that the individual who instigates for crime bears equal guilt to the one who carries it out. He reminded the jury of John Gallagher's remark, I'll finish him off before I go to Bradford. He said that this indicated his intent to harm, adding that the statement was reportedly made between the two altercations, after which he returned to the house and followed through on his threat. The judge then spoke about the defendant, Mrs Emily Swan, and looking straight at the jury, he said, It is my duty to tell you that one does not commit murder only with one's hands. If one person instigates another to commit murder, and that other person does it, the instigator is also guilty of murder. He then advised the jury to be aware of the importance of accountability in their deliberations. When the jury returned, the foreman announced that they found both John Gallagher and Emily Swan guilty of the murder of Mr William Swan. Before sentencing, Justice Darling asked both defendants if they had anything to say. Emily replied, I am innocent. I am not afraid of immediate death because I am innocent and will go to God. Justice Darling then sentenced Emily Swan and John Gallagher to death. As the sentence was pronounced, all eyes in the courtroom seemed to be on Emily, yet to everyone's amazement, she remained completely unshaken. With a calm, almost defiant smile, she glanced at someone in the gallery and blew a kiss, as if death itself couldn't touch her. It was a moment of eerie composure in the face of an inevitable and grim fate. Following the sentencing, the judge again addressed the jury. He wanted to make them aware of additional evidence that had been withheld to avoid prejudicing Mrs Swan's case. He shared with them a statement made by John Gallagher when he was first arrested. Mr Gallagher had told the police that it was Emily who had struck William and beat him with the poker, while Mr Gallagher himself claimed he hadn't touched the victim, though admitted that he was in the room. The judge mentioned that although this wasn't direct evidence against Mrs Swan, the positioning of the poker and the wounds on the deceased man's body made him believe that there was some truth in Mr Gallagher's statement and that Mrs Swan had indeed taken part in the killing. The courtroom fell into a stunned silence as the weight of this revelation sank in. The case was seen as a display of fairness in the legal process, which had refrained from using such damning evidence in order to give Mrs Swan a fair trial. The newspapers reported that even without this crucial piece of testimony, the jury had nonetheless still believed that Emily Swan was guilty of the crime. The prisoners were then taken from court to Armley Prison, from where they both appealed the verdict and their sentences. Emily in particular continued to protest her innocence and received guidance from the Protestant chaplain while efforts began to get her a reprieve. Supporters claimed that a year earlier, in December 1902, Emma Kitty Byron had her death sentence commuted to life in prison following the murder of Arthur Reginald Baker, a gentleman whom she lived with and who had been very violent towards her. However, despite this, Emily's sentence was not commuted and she and John were informed that they would be hanged together on the 29th of December 1903. By now, John Gallagher had come to terms with his fate and showed little emotion or resistance in the face of his impending execution. In contrast, Emily had been in a state of hysteria since her conviction, frequently blaming John for his indifference towards her plight, and accused him of being more focused on his own fate than on hers. 
Despite her outward despair, she continued to struggle with the weight of her actions and her role in the crime. She repeatedly expressed her deep concern to the prison guards about the disgrace her situation was bringing to her family. In one last desperate attempt to save her, Emily's friends and supporters made a plea to the king for clemency. However, their appeal, like many before it, went unheard. Emily Swan would hang just before going to the gallows. It was reported that she confessed her guilt to the chaplain. It had been decided that John Gallagher and Emily Swan would be hanged together. So in the morning of the 29th of December 1903, Emily stepped onto the platform. There she saw John already in position, a white hood covering his head. She looked at him and managed to say the words, Good morning, John. As they both prepared for their final moments, in what could be seen as a poignant or tragic gesture of affection, John Gallagher responded by saying, Good morning, love. And then, just as the trapdoor opened, he quietly said, Goodbye. God bless you. This brief and emotional exchange between them highlighted the grim conclusion of a case that had bound their fates together in both life and death. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for watching. In this video, I mentioned the trial of Kitty Byron, and I covered that case in January 2022. So if any of you would like to watch it, I've left a link in the description. Please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.